there. I, I got them up here. You can grab them after class or something. Um, there, there are a few I have some fairly basic notes on. Um, so, um, so, so I think most of you are on track uh, for, for having a good project proposal to we'll turn it in. And there are a couple of you who I located by email as well. So if you have not either gotten a specific location by email or you didn't turn it in, um, I'm going to try and cross-check with those with uh, who, um, well, if, if you end up not doing a, uh, a, a, an approved project and you took the class for three credits, then at the end you'll end up not, um, you'll end up not getting a very good grade in the class or something. So, um, you should make sure that your project was approved. If you're not sure, uh, um, um, I'm talking to you. Send me an email. Um, let's see, so, so there, there are a few of you who've talked about using Amazon Web Services or who, who, who may not have the computing resources they need. Um, if, if you would like some uh, Amazon Web Services, I'm planning to um, write a big request for the whole class in the next few days and in the next week. So please, um, so if you're interested, please send me a specific email asking for, um, to tell me how many people are in your group, roughly what you're planning to do and, and how many hours you think you would need. Last time I did this a couple years ago, I got about 100 hours per student, but it might end up being only about 50 hours per student. Um, and, and or no, it was not hours. That was that was a uh, hundred dollars per student credits. Uh, so the cheap. So there's a free tier of machines, um, which I haven't looked recently. Last time, those the free tier did not have a dupe installed on them, um, and they were one of those was not power enough, uh, powerful enough. This was even I think last year at some point to handle the 1% feed from Twitter if you're doing that. So you would need um, one of the more powerful machines in order to do that. And you should look on there what the prices are, but it's about everything included, it's about 40 cents an hour or so to run a dupe, and maybe half of that if you're not putting a dupe. There's different tiers. But I, I, haven't, I haven't looked at this recently, so the change, prices may have changed. Um, but so, so if you're interested in that, Please send me an email by the end of the week, and then I'll put in a big request. And uh, I, I don't anticipate any problems with that. And if there are issues, then we'll figure out a way to deal with it. Um, let's see. Um, so, um, so with regards to the scribing notes, um, I put. If you look at the bottom of the web page underneath where the schedule is, I put up some links to some example, an example PDF and, um, and some example um, tech, um, um, a lot tech file and some, and also a style file. So you don't need to modify the lot tech file. This has in it uh, um, some example algorithms and it's actually, basically from my data mining class and there's some small, there's like two lectures with the overlap on some of the streaming algorithms. And so we won't need scribes for those algorithms, but because I already, so the examples I gave are of, of those lectures. So that'll give an example of what the scribe notes might look like. I don't quite expect to use yours to be as, as nice as mine, um, but if they are, then that'd be great. Um, so, so when it comes to your turn to describe, you have questions, uh, um, you can let me know at that point. But I'll just, hopefully you're able to do a pretty decent job enough for the rest of the class. Um, all right. OK, so, um, so, uh, uh, um, so today we're going to be talking about um, these IO um, Efficient uh, algorithms, um, and uh, specifically, we'll be talking about sorting. Um, and sorting is 
like a really important problem in a lot of computer science, and uh, and the techniques here give a lot of good examples of the sort of things you'll need to know in order to do other sorts of problems. And these are algorithms that are actually uh, fairly efficient um, in practice when you're dealing with um, we deal with this much data. So I'll be I'll be writing on the board if ever a color is not good or it's too small or you can't read something I wrote, please please stop me immediately. Probably other people have the same concern. Okay, so the basic model here is that the data is really big and it's stored on um, and it's stored on a disk. And there's also some um, some RAM and this RAM is of size. Um, um, this RAM is of um, size M, and then there's this um, CPU. I'm not sure why a CPU looks something like this, but this is kind of how I draw CPUs. And so the RAM and the CPU can talk to each other and basically do anything they want. Um, but Birds eye view of an old prey. What? Oh. Birds eye view of an old prey. Ah. Okay, that's interesting. All right, so, so but um, talking between the RAM and the disk is very expensive, and when you, when you pull data from the disk, it comes in like a strip on the disk, and this corresponds to some block um, that's in the RAM, and this um, block is a size D. Okay, so when you, when you move, data from disk to RAM, it happens in the sock in this block of size B, and you move this whole chunk of data at once. And so moving these blocks of data, you know, um, one movement of a block, um, this operation is, is called an I.O. We want to minimize the number of I.O.s, either to disk from, from RAM or vice versa. Usually just counting pulling from disk to RAM is, is, uh, is, is sufficient, but we'll count both uh, the reads from this and also the writes from this. These both count as one I.O. And this is the large bottleneck when dealing with lots of data that's, that's stored on disk. Much more than you can fit in the RAM. Right, so, so you can, so the, um, the, so the input size is going to be N. Okay, and just to summarize this, um, the um, block size is, is B. Um, the memory size is M. That, that means there are M over B blocks in the memory. Okay, and and there are in the full data set there are N over B. Um, blocks of, of data. Okay, and and the and the cost um, will be um, will be in the I O's. All right, so we're going to count the number of these I O movements. All right. So does anyone have any um, questions about th this model? We spent most of, uh, or basically all, of, or most of Friday talking about this. I know some of you missed it, and again, apologies. I accidentally deleted the the, the video. I'm not great with you know technology and stuff all the time, um, but hopefully we'll we'll be able to streamline this in the future, and we'll be able to get the other videos up. Um, okay, so so. We're going to start by talking about the two most basic data structures. Um, so, the, so um, and th these are very basic in the internal model, but really the the true core building blocks in the in, in the ex external memory model. Um, and these are going to be. Um, um, so a stack and a queue. And I'm not talking about like a um, like a fancy priority queue. There are highly efficient priority queues as well. This is just a regular queue. Are we assuming 
mentioned that the um, we're not building up enough of a percentage of the disk that the disk access time slows way down the operating system scans the disk looking for a few sectors. We are going to be essentially controlling where the memory is written on the disk. So it won't need to scan, it will tell where you okay. are. So, it's a, so don't worry about that. In practice, they'll also probably do that. These may be considerations, but these are small on order on the order. We're going to assume that the disk is actually infinite. So the, the official definition of the model is that the disk is, has an infinite amount of space, although that's not true. But it's going to be much more than, than the size of the model. And, and, and also, this is becoming less and less true. I was chatting with, uh, I was chatting with Clement, um, that there are now these, these computers that have these, um, these SSDs, these solid state drives, where a lot of the similar hardware made you know, for RAM is being used as, as the disk. Um, where the disk, or, or where the SSD storage is, is stored with respect to the motherboard, um, and because of the size of it, it's not as fast as the smaller caches. And there are still these bottlenecks here, but it's much less, uh, um, it's much less dramatic. These are much more expensive um, to build a system like this. And, and to get really, really large storage sizes, you still may be better to do it on, on, uh, on a disk. You could get those larger stuff. So still a lot of processing of um, large data sets like, uh, you know, like um, terrain data, GIS data is done with the disk and there still are these, these bottlenecks. And, but you can design algorithms to, uh, um, to get around this. Okay, so, so, uh, so stack and a queue, right? So, so a stack, um, basically what it does is you have this, this data and so you put elements in and then you, um, you pop the elements off the top of the stack, right? So as you put in an element, it goes to the bottom, put another element, it comes here. So you say, this is five, this is three, put another one, this is seven. If you pop it off, then you pop off a seven and you remove it from the top of the queue. You can't access five until you've taken off the seven and the, and the three and so forth. Okay, um, the, the queue is, has, you know, it, it works from both ends. You, you put in an element, um, you put in here, and you pop from the other side, right? So if you put in a five, you put in a three, you put in a seven, then you pop off, the first thing you get is a five. You can't get to the seven, so you pop off the five and the three. Okay, so these are standard stacks and queues. Okay, so how would we do this? Build a stack in a queue. Um, let's start with just the stack in the so in a day's day structure that's IO efficient. So imagine that we're gonna potentially put in enough data to everything on our disk. We're gonna we're gonna read from our disk and we're gonna store it in a stack, or maybe some subset of the data. So how do we do this? Okay. We would just split the stack into blocks in consecutively. Yeah, um, that's essentially right. So, so if we're doing this IO efficiently, what we're going to do is we're going to think of this stack being like this, and we're going to start putting in material, in, in, in items here, say 5, 3, 7. And then once we've reached here, this size is going to be B. Mm -hmm. Once we've filled this up, we can think of shifting this off to um, off to the disk. But we don't want to do it quite yet, right? So it could be that um, we're and we're going to take this whole chunk of data and and, and and move this to disk. We don't quite want to do it as soon as we fill it. Let's say that we fill this up here, and then we put in another element nine. We're like, okay, we want to do this next block. Let's throw this one on disk. But then if we do um, we, we do a pop and we do another pop, we take this nine off and then we take off the eight. If this if this whole block was sent onto disk, we would have retrieved this whole block. Okay? 
So it's slightly differently. Um, what we do is we have this, this block um, or, or this, this queue, and when we, um, and so we're gonna have this, this block up here, which is active. Um, this active block of data. We're gonna have the next one down. Um, so, so these two are going to be in memory. And, and everything that's um, so, so everything after here is going to be on disk. Okay, so if we um, if we start popping stuff off here, we'll have to pop off everything in this whole block before we need to get something from them. Okay, and in fact, what we can do, or, or do you mean pop everything out before you have to get something from this? Oh, oh, that's right, yeah. So pop everything out before you have to get something from this. Right, so if you really want to, so this only requires two blocks in memory to make it fairly efficient. Um, if instead you want to make it even more efficient in memory, uh, in, the, in the IO model with a lot of popping and uh, um, with pop, pops, possibly with a lot of pops and inputs with large you know, strings of pops. Um, what you can do is you can say, I'm going to um, store up to M over B blocks in memory because I don't care about anything else. I, I'm not running an OS, right? I'm just doing this. Then you put M over B blocks in, in, in memory and you can, you can handle a lot more pops before you have to get anything from this. Um, but in order to get it fairly efficient, you just need the top two blocks in memory. Okay, so, um, so basically what you can do is the, um, how does data work on a disk? Just write some access or so, a sequential access file? So you're, you're somehow getting an input, either it's being streamed through an, an input stream or it's being read from, from disk in some, some way that's sequential. So don't worry about how you're getting the data. The, the, the data could be coming in from, you know, uh, like off the network or, or you could be reading it from disk, but uh, you're not worried so much about those, those IOs just with respect to the data structure. Um, okay, so let's see. So, so, um, so, um, so, so every time you do um, an, an in operation, so, um, how many IOs does it take to do an in? And let's, so if, in the worst case, if you do one in, how many IOs do we have to do? Right, right, it could be that this in caused you to fill up an entire block, and then you, you need to push something on the disk to get, get the next block ready. So it, it could be, um, it could be one, but if you, it's it's actually n n over um, or one over b amortized uh, highs. So it, it it takes it takes um, b inputs and before you need to force a block to be pushed onto the disk. Um, and on the on the pops, um, so, so, so on a pop, the, the worst case is one, and it's also um, one over over the amortized. Because you have to read, um, you have to pop B elements before you need to get the next block to the disk. So the so this is less than one, but you're gonna. This only matters if you're doing a bunch of these, and for most of them, it's not gonna take any items. Basically, it's, it's gonna take B um, inputs or pops before you have to do any items. Amortize or pops? Well, so amortize is when you're 
averaging over a large set of intervals, right? So let's say I'm going to do a total of n ins and pops. Then the total time is going to be n over b, or the total number of IOs is n over b. Yeah, so, so let's say, so, um, so, so the, the, there's going to be a sequence of um, data. So how many IOs? The this the stack can be done is that the total over, of excuse me, is that and, over theta you just wrote? Um this is theta. So, so let's just say n. Yeah. So uh, a, a sequence of n ins and pops, and it's gonna take a um, so it's gonna take a total of O of n over b ions. So any sequence of n is the pops. As long as you always have something on the q to pop, or if you don't, then you can return it on. Right. So, so this means that per n or per pop, the cost is 1 over b. Right? If I divide by the total number, it's going to be 1 over b. OK. So a q is basically the same, but it's it's slightly different. Right? So um, so how would I how would I organize a Q to also allow me to do ins and pops and uh, or, or I guess maybe they're called pops or something. Like um, ins and pops so I get total of N over B IOs for N ins and pops. How would I structure my Q to do this? So regarding the stack, I mean this all n or b, this is really like the worst case that you could have. Uh, yeah, it's the worst um, case. So, so we'll I generally be talking about worst case analysis. Um, what I'm trying to emphasize is because like many times when you actually do algorithms with stack, you, you might be like between two blocks going up, down, push, pull, push, pull, pull, yeah. pull push, push. So, and then you do really basically all of well, you do everything with the RAM. So. Uh, yeah, right, right. So what, what, the reason why we really care about worst case is we're going to, these are really the building blocks of a lot of the algorithms, and we're going to really try and abuse these as much as possible. And really we're going to give them the worst case sort of, uh, sort of inputs um, in certain cases. So we want to use these results on, um, with, with other, uh, inside other data structures and not worry about average case or the special ways you can analyze these average case methods. Algorithms. So, um, yeah. So, so for instance, if you, if every time you flipped a coin, it was either an in or a pop, um, then it would probably be much better because you would probably not have to retrieve from disk or push to disk too many times. But if our goal is sort of, don't we have to read through the data more than once? It looks like our that's true. That's true. We're going to well, we're going to get to that. We're going to okay. get to that. Okay. So okay. So let's let's talk about a Q. So how do you do a Q? There's only only two. You, you can do it again with only two blocks. They they you need inside of them. Okay. So let me draw one of these really long Qs. Um, okay, so, so you pop out here and you put in here. Okay, so 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 there's a whole bunch of blocks in here. There could be n over b blocks, maybe, you know, or theta n over b blocks. Which ones do I need to keep in memory? If you think it's not the ones where I put these dots here, okay. Um, I'm, I'm not going to let you answer this, but someone else? The one at the beginning and at the end? Yeah, that's right. Um, it's pretty simple, right? So you have blocks which are dictated by where you start popping. 
Um, and, and so you, you're going to have a whole bunch of blocks. You're going to have a whole bunch of the blocks. And, and when you're putting stuff in, as soon as you um, fill up a block here, you can send um, you can you can send it off the disk as long as it's not towards the front. If it's at the front, you might need to pop soon. So as soon as you have um, so um, so what you want to do is you want to if you have uh, the block near the front, you need to have in memory because you could be you could be popping off this. And if you're loading in here, then you want to have it in memory because you need to fill it up before you load it in. As soon as you fill it up, you can send it off to disk. Right? As as soon as you fill up this this block, you can uh, um, or as as soon as you read everything in this block, you can go get the next one. You probably want to prefetch and get a few ahead of time. But these, there's no need to, as soon as you fill them, you can send them to this. You're not going to touch them again until you pop everything from off here. So you only need, um, so this is in memory, and this one is in memory. So again, you only need two blocks of memory. And you can get the same, um, you can get the same uh, runtime as before. Still, you know, it could be that one in, one in or one pop is going to trigger an I.O., but amortize is 1 over B. Basically, a sequence of N ins and pops is only going to take O of N over B IOs. Um, it could be less, it could be 2 times N over B IOs in the worst case, if everything goes to this end. I don't get this. Why can't you write it first? You can, the first block you don't want to write to disk because you could need to pop it. So if you, I mean, you could write to disk and then call it back immediately. Uh, but you want to keep the, you, you want to retrieve it from disk as soon as you're going to ask to pop something. You probably want to call it back a little bit ahead of time. That way you don't need to wait for it to come to disk. We have it there at your disposal. So if you if you pop it and then you say I want to put it back in the queue, you put it back over here. Um, that's just how a queue works. If you think you're going to need it again, maybe you want to stack, or maybe you just want to keep it stored some other way. But th th this is just like a basic building block. There are other ways to deal with data, but these are very convenient ways to think about things. And in fact, we're going to use the queue in, inside of inside the sorting, room. and you'll you'll see that. Um, I'll, I'll start doing that. So, unless there are any more questions on it. Uh, when we put something in this uh, queue, uh, uh, I can't understand why we, do, uh, we have to wait uh, for uh, it to get to the uh, end of this queue to go to this. So, we don't have to put it to disk, but if our memory is full, then we could put it on disk and not worry about because we won't need to access it until we pop off a bunch of other things. Right? If, if, I am, if I want to get to this, this piece of, if this is like, um, like, if this is like, um, like 10 terabytes of data, right? The amount of time it's going to take me after I've enqueued something to get to it, if there's 10 terabytes of data in here, I need to pop off all the elements ahead of there. That's going to take a long time. Maybe that's going to take a day to get there. So I can put it on disk now while I pull these other blocks into memory. If my memory happens to be really big, I can fit it all in there. I don't need to put anything in this. But if this is too big to fit in memory, then, then I can put the middle part here onto disk. And I can only, and you know, I only need this block to, I need to fill up before I send it to disk. And this one I'm actually accessing and reading. Okay. So, um, okay, so 
Um, so sorting, um, okay, so there are lots of items for sorting. Which ones, which one do you think will be the easiest one to do um, in external memory? Merge sort. Uh, the merge sort. Um, anyone think anything else? Well, which one, if you were to implement Excellent. sorting, which one would you do? Okay, so, some of the authors have been recommending or have been recommending doing some random samples of the data and then picking an algorithm that seems to match whatever chance order you detect. Yeah, there there are these these uh, adaptive algorithms that will adapt to the input in certain certain ways. Although, you know, um, and for really large data, you actually well, we'll talk about what the the fastest sorting arrows do, do later for massive data. There used to be this, this benchmark on how fast you sort the largest amount of data. And they've kind of settled on one algorithm we'll eventually get to. But the, 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 you know, a lot of the traits we'll see in these IO efficient algorithms. Um, okay, so, so, this, so these are two very common things in internal memory. These are both N, R, N. Right, and when I talk about internal memory, I'll try and use lowercase n, just so you don't confuse it. Okay, so we're gonna do, so if, if I have time, I'll do both of these in external memory. Um, the merge sort is gonna be simpler to understand. The quick sort, or there's a version of it called the distribution sort, which is, is the, is I think the fastest available implementation is, uh, is based on the distribution sort, which is kind of like a, is a version of, of the quick sort. Okay. So, so, so does everyone remember how the how the merge sort works? Okay. You divide the list into chunks, or each chunk by whatever order suits you, and then merge the chunks together. So. Right. Um, yeah. So I'll summarize this. So you um, you one di um, divide into chunks. You um, sort chunks, and this step is recursive. Um, and then you um, merge chunks. And it's important that that the chunks are already sorted when you merge them. Um, so so the so dividing into chunks is easy. This is kind of for free. The data, you think the data is stored on disk in blocks. It's already divided into size B chunks. Um, you, we'll we'll want to do different sorts of chunks, but sorting in the chunks is going to be the recursive step. So this is going to kind of uh, magically appear out of nowhere. And the merge step is the, is, is the interesting part here, right? So if we're doing this in internal memory, what we have is two sorted lists. Um, so you have A and you have you know, B, and the you can think of having these in, um, and you the output is going to be one sorted list, right? So, so you're going to have let's say that the elements are three, five, ten, fourteen, and this one is seven, eight. 12, um, 15, 20, right? So what you do is you you first find the minimum of these two, you write three, the minimum, of, and then you cross this off, the minimum is five, then you take this one here, you know, seven, and so forth, right? Okay, so this is the merging step, and it requires that these are sorted. Okay, so now, how do we do this in external memory? Is this something we can do in external memory? No, you're shaking. Yeah? Yeah, so, so think of each of these lists as a long file, right? And we've we've kept a we we need to have some some uh, 
and the file, we're assuming these files are, are going to be sorted. Right, so we have these files that are sorted, and we, we want to output to another file that's sorted. Right, so this is exactly how you would actually implement this is you have like a file IOs, um, and, and you, you and, and, and the, the, the compiler can actually help you do this if you were to just do file reads and file writes. Sometimes it'll try and open up the whole file. Other times it will write on demand and automatically will kind of, uh, um, kind of do the artificial arms for you. Um, but if the data is streaming whether it is not coming from files, then how do we decide that one? Well, so, so, uh, so assume you know how the data is stored and you're gonna access it, right? This file, so, okay, so let's, let's talk about this queue again, right? So, so let's a little bit more details of how you implement this, right? When you, when you write this guy, this, um, um, this, this block onto disk, right? At the end here, the last cell tells you the location of the next block, right? So when you get to the end here, I know where the next block is that I can go and, and fetch. I know where to fetch that. Place. So then I now I just need my my uh, my uh, if you implement your own uh, like uh, implement your own mallet, right? You just need to find blocks of size B on disk. You don't need to worry about smaller blocks of memory. Um, so if you've ever implemented that, the hard part is you get these disjointed oddly sized chunks of memory you have to keep collapsing. Right? If they're all size B, it's a lot easier. You just divide up your disk into chunks of size B and you index it. Right? You say number 72, right? that points you to one chunk of size B and you write right that way. Just like you would pieces of memory. Instead of, the, instead of storing a byte, you store a block. Okay, so then this can be like the length of this. Okay. Yeah. So we are assuming that we have these sorted lists, right? And basically, we just want to do the merge step, right? Yeah, we just need to do the merge step. Yeah. So we have these sorted lists. We have two sorted lists, and we need to do output sorted lists. So we should have n over n sorted lists, right? Well, let's let's just worry about this simple step where you're merging. Uh, let's, you have two sorted lists and you want to merge them to one sorted list. Is this something that can be done in Well, you said we have two blocks in memory, so I assume we can pull in two blocks and then just start merging them. As soon as we have one block, as soon as we merge half of each block, we've got a couple of them block that can be passed out and then we keep working. Yeah, yeah. So I think. You can do this in two blocks. You're actually going to need three blocks in the easiest to describe. Um, Is there a way of doing it still better? So, yeah, so you can do this with only three blocks, right? So, so, so how would you do this with, or let's say, let's say I give you six blocks in memory. How would you do this? And I'm going to use a previous result we mentioned today. Uh, well, you, you need one one block for your output, and right. then the rest of them you just use as input queues, and you just have multiple, multiple um, inputs for the merge. Yeah, right. So if these are both queues, I can take look at the top element, and I can look at it without removing it from the queue. I can I can also do a, a top operation where I just look at it, without it. and then the smaller of the two, I move to the output, and I need another block. Here, this is a queue, right? So this is two blocks, two blocks, and two blocks, because they're all queues, right? So, um, so then I can do this with only in, in ex external in in uh, external memory uh, model, where where I only need. Uh, so basically, the thing to realize is you only need this part in the memory, and this part and this part can be on disk. You're writing to a block. When the block fills up then you send it off to disk, right? And you keep reading off here, and when you read off the first block, you call the next block. In practice, wouldn't you want to have 
a couple reserved output blocks handy so one block can be being written up to this what you're proceeding to. Yeah, to yeah. So you do some, the hopefully the, the compiler will take care of this one. Okay. Or OS or something. So does the read programming language have support to access the memory on the disk? Can you do this in the read programming language? Uh, every programming language. Uh, well, not every programming language. You can do it in C. You can, you can do this. So I, I, I don't have assignments in this class this year. Maybe you have it in the database class. Do something like this. But uh, last week, probably class, the assignment was to implement this word store. And you look at different types of file IOs and see which ones work best. Okay, but there are a variety of ways of implementing this to different file IOs. Um, so if you're doing C, that can do it. You can probably do it in Java, but I'm not sure what you, what you want to. Um, okay, so, all right, so, so th th this algorithm is, is, is okay, but this is not gonna be optimal. It's not going to be the optimal algorithm. Um, this needs about, um, so th the algorithm I described here needs memory to have O of 1 um, blocks, right? But in practice, we have that M equals, um, you know, you, you have some number of blocks, which depends on B. You, you can have M over B blocks. How can we use these blocks more more effectively? So let's go back and look at this this algorithm again. The, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to have this input, and it's going to be unsorted, right? And so the so it's going to be a bunch of small things here. And the first thing we're going to do is this data is actually stored in these blocks. So the, the, the first step is we're going to pass all of these blocks through memory. We're going to read through this once, and we're going to sort each block. Right? So 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 the, the round one in, in O of N over B I O's, we're going to sort each block. Okay. Um, you can actually break it into chunks of of M over B blocks and sort each one. But let's just say we sort each one. Okay, so, so now we're, we're going to have a set of these sorted blocks, and we have a memory of size M, and we want to create um, some um, create some larger um, some some larger sorted cubes. Okay? So, so what we can fit put um, we're going to put M over B uh, blocks in memory. And if you really care, this is going to be theta M over B. We're not, we're not going to quite fit all of it. But let's say M over B blocks in memory. Okay, what can we do with M over B blocks? Well, actually, we, we can sort. They all fit in memory, so we can sort each one. So, so now the output in O of N over B IOs is going to be N over M over B sorted Qs. Okay? So now I've taken chunks of size. Um, of size M, or M over B blocks, and I've sorted each of these chunks. And each of these is now in Q. Okay, so now the tricky part. I can't fit any of these in, in, in memory, so I need to do something like this, but I'm gonna do something a little bit more important. So these are Q, so I don't need to put them all in memory, right? So I can take Theta M over B um, Q's. Um, what does theta stand for here? It's it's uh, um, 
So, so, so a big O is an upper bound, and a, a large omega is a lower bound, and theta has big O and big, and big omega. Is that is that clear for everyone? Has everyone else has anyone not seen theta before? So, so this means that it's some constant times this. There may be lower order terms. Um, in practice, well, let's just say it's one half m over b. Part of why we you end up neglecting the constant is what the constant ends up being is highly dependent on how your data is ordered when you get it. So, uh, well, you can prove bounds independent of the size of the data, um, up to you know, with in the worst case bounds in the data sets. Well, it's okay. Um, so you have m over v q's. And so what are you going to do with these m over v q's? Well, here we know how to do it with two q's, but why can't I actually do the same thing here? With M over B of these um, cubes. Right, so I can fit the first block of all of these in memory, and I only need one output Q still. Right, so I'm going to take the first block of all of these, take the smallest one, and for each Q, whenever the smallest block has been emptied out, I go and grab the next block. So I only need one block for each of these Qs, and I need one, one output block to write. So I can take these M over B Qs, and the output it, you know, here is, is going to be one um, sort of And then I'm just going to keep repeating this step until I've uh, until I've until I've merged everything back up. Right. So so in the in the first round, I'm going to have um, let's say I'm going to have n over b. Uh, so, so so let's say that the the round will have the number of Q's and the um, size of Q, right? So in the, in the first round, everything is going to be size um, size B. The number of Q's is going to be N over B first round. Right? In, the, in the second round, the, the size of the Q's, the output here is going to be M. Because I can take each of these blocks, I can take M of these blocks, uh, um, M over B of these blocks, and I can um, merge them all into, into a, to a single Q. So now the number of Qs can be N over M. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so now, well, I'm going to, the, the size of the Q is going to increase by a factor of M, uh, by a factor of M over B. So I can take M over B of these Qs, and, um, and so I'm going to get M times M over B is going to be the size of each Q at the end of this round. And so then the number is going to be N B over M squared. And so then after so, so let's, to make this a little simpler, let's say this is round minus one, this is round zero, this is round one. Okay, so now in round I, I'm gonna have an M times M over B to the I size of the Q. And then the number of Qs is going to be N over M, um, divided by M over B to the I. Um, did I get that right? 
Uh, th this is round zero. Yeah. Uh, this, sorry. You can actually go do this in round in the first one, actually, or before the first one. Yeah. You you can actually do this before you actually run the algorithm. So, so, okay. So what well, what I want at the end is that so I want to know what round um, such that this number is going to be equal to one. So I have one cube. And this number is equal to n. After I've done that, it's sorted, right? It's a single sorted cube. So, so what is this value k? So I want to solve for so solve for k such that n over m times m over v to the k is equal to one. So you're going to get something like uh, k is equal to log of base m over b of n over m. Do you believe this? Yeah. So we're going to have. I mean, if you do log, in a way that I, I'm computing, if you do log of n over b on the base of n over n over n. Yeah, so if you started, you could start here, make this n over b, and add 1 to this. It's, it, it's, it's not going to make that much of a difference. So m and b are going to be polynomially unrelated, generally. So if they're inside of here, it's not going to matter so much. Um, okay, so so this is roughly how many rounds I need. So maybe I needed, you know, one plus log m over b n over b um, rounds. Okay. Um, so. So if I need this many rounds, how long does the whole algorithm take? How long did each round take? What? No? So each round, this is one round. Each one of these is a round. This is essentially the number of rounds. So I'm taking all of my queues, and for each queue, it needs to pass through this meat grinder here once. So I need to, yes, so you're, you're making it too complicated. So you, it's, you can count how many times you do this operation with different queues. But you could just think each queue needs to run through here once. Look at each element of the data. How many times is it going to run through either one queue or is it going to come out of here? Each element of the data is going to come out of here once every every round. Right? Each one of these rounds, every element comes out here once. And these algorithms are are um, are linear. The queues are are linear. And linear I mean n over b. N over b is linear in, in extra one. So each of these algorithms is linear in terms of the number of items. I, for every block, I need to call it into memory once in each round. So that means that, so that, um, so I have O of N over B, IOs each round, and that means the total time of the sorting is N over B times log base M over B times of N over B, which is 
what we want. So and this this space is, is going to be pretty large, right? If if now if you only have two blocks of of memory, you can actually or you know you only have two blocks of memory. You can only stick two queues at once, and this is a log base two, right? But if you have more blocks, then this becomes faster. Uh, in Java, we can get the number of cues. It's n by m divided by m by v cube. This is called i. So when we make it equal to one, then five will be multiplied. Um. So you want. So you want this number to be equal to one, meaning you have one cube, right? Does that make sense? So I want to find the value i or the value k such that this term. N over M? Oh, uh, divided by. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So this, is, so this should be divided by. I, I think this number is, this, it still should be a log here. So let's, let's work this out. This is N over M that is equal to, you can divide through M over B to the power K. Um, I'm going to take a log m over b of, of both sides, and I get n over m, and this is equal to uh, okay. k. So it's, yeah, so it's right, yeah. So, yeah, thanks. That was a mistake. Okay, so, so anyone have any questions on how this works, or? So in each step, uh, we are increasing the queue size, right? The, the size of the queue increases oh, in, yes. in each step. But these, these bounds for the queue were independent of the size of the queue. They didn't care what the size of the queue was. It still took essentially 1 over B uh, IOs for each input and in, in OK. And uh, after output of uh, each step, the queue is sorted, right? Correct. And uh, okay, so once the queue size increases over uh, the size of the queue is more than the size of the memory, how do you sort in the memory? So the the queue is sorted, but the only part I need in the memory is is right here. I only need the first element of the queue, of the input queues, and the last element of the output queue the current last element. So I only need this part in memory at once. And this is only one block from each of the queues, and one block for output. Okay. Right, so, so I only need, so if I have, if the number of queues here is m over b queues, the total number of blocks I need in memory, I actually need m equals to the, uh, the I, I need a number, this is the number of blocks to actually be m over b plus 1. So this is one block, two blocks, up to m over b blocks, and then one more block over here. So that's why I lied, this is m, m over b minus 1, but it's kind of, that, that goes into the, that gets hidden in the big one. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So the, 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 the whole the whole concept here is you only need this part of it in memory at once. The rest you can keep on disk until you need it. Mm. So you can help you move over Each 
becomes a single sorted queue. And I only called each block into memory once, so it's a linear number of IOs. And the total number of sorted queues is now n over n over b. Because this is um, this is the size of each sorted queue, and this is the size of my data. So my total data, this is the number of sorted queues. The, the, the size of each sorted queue, so I this many sorted queues. Number of queues, right? Yeah, so I, I mean, yeah, I write them all to disk, but don't worry about the number of queues I write to disk. Actually worry about the number of times I process each, each data point. Right? Each data point is processed once each run. Right? It's, it's only at the head of the queue. It can be at the head of a queue for a while, but it only gets moved to the tail of this queue once. Right? So I, that means it's a linear number of items. And I only need this uh, log m over b, log of base m over b, n over, n over m. Yeah. Uh, like for each round, the number of queues increase, right? So the n by m or by n by b, the whole power is the number of queues. The number of queues is uh, is going down, actually, and dividing by a larger number. Yeah, and m over b is is a uh, is number greater than one. Is at least two. So th this number of queues is decreasing until I get to size of one, and then I'm done. That's, that queue is sorted and it's done. Okay, so, so let me, I've got about 10 minutes left, so let me talk about how to do the quick sort very, very quickly. Is, is that okay, or would you rather ask questions about this? Um, and then, we may have more time for it on Friday. Um, I'll talk about searching in bee trees on Friday. And uh, um, that one, I don't think will take this long. Okay, so. Okay, so, um, so if I can do a quick sort. All right, so, so how's this, this, uh, this work? You start with an unsorted array. You pick an element at, at random. Um, um, the pivot P, right? And then, and then you process over um, all the elements you you compare to P, and either they go to the left array or they um, they go to the right array. And these arrays don't need to be even, but if you pick this at random, they're approximately going to be a good enough split. In fact, um, you can, if you compute the median, it will be exactly random. And the median you can do in linear time. Um, and so then you can get this to be um, exactly an even split to equal size pieces. And then you recursively do this on, on each of the pieces. You have, you have a pivot. And, and each of the elements you split to either LL or to LR. You know, and, and, um, right, and you keep doing this, and all these are all these are larger than these, which are larger. So when you're done, you eventually have a list that's sorted. Okay. So now, if you do this like this, you're going to have um, log base two and rounds. And each round, and each of these rounds is going to take O of n over O of n over b. So there, there are two issues with this. The first one is that um, it's a log of n instead of log of n over b or n over m. 
and the second is it's a log base two instead of um, some larger base. Okay. So how would we how would we do better than a log base two? That's the first kind of conceptual thing. So I want to get so so how would I decrease the log in this? Or do you have like more log of one point one or something? No no no. Uh, so so I, I, I want this instead to be um, to be uh, log of k of f, where k, or I'll, I'll eventually set k equals to f over b, right? So, so even without worrying about, um, don't worry about how long this takes to do, just worry about decreasing the number of rounds here. Uh, how would I do that? And don't worry about external memory. <coughs> so no, you can you split it up into more than two blocks each time. Yeah. Right. Right. So if you split it up into uh, um, in, 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 into k blocks, you're going to get a log of base k. Right. So if you split it up into m over b blocks, you have a log of base m over b. Okay. And so does this make sense from the IO model? I can have each of these L and R, I don't care about how they're sorted yet. I'm not sorting them now. I can just pump them into a stack or a queue. Right? So I can split based on, instead of one pivot, I'm going to have these um, M over B um, pivots. And so, And instead of left and a right, I'm going to have these m over b of these object blocks. Okay, and and so I can't, you know, I can't fit each of them in memory. That's okay. I can. This is the number of them. The size of them may be big, but they're a stack or a queue. So as soon as I fill up a block there, I can dump the memory, and then the next pass over, I'll come back and handle. So, so I, I need to get more of these uh, of these uh, um, of these pivots. Um, okay. So um, the second thing is I want this n to be an n over b instead. Um, so in order to do this, um, so so oh, what, what do I need this? So, so essentially, I can get this log of m over b to n. So I have this log of m over b to n. I want this to be log of m over b of n over b. I don't want it to be log of n. How would I, how would I do this? So, so it's. The, the, the difference between these two may not actually be that, that big, uh, but I just want to conceptually help you understand how, where is this coming from. And it's going to, I'm going to need a single pass of the data so that instead of the, so, so this one, this was equal to log of m over b of n. That would be announced if I used m over b pivots, right? But I needed to get, um, from n size each each uh, grouping, which is unsorted, but in each grouping is of size n. Uh, I, I have one of them of size n. At the end, I'm going to have n of them of size one. So th so that's how I got this analysis. I decreased by a factor m over b each time. Okay. Okay, Tom, you can answer this time. Well, you can split the array in the queues, queues and you again have only queues. What? So? You can split the array instead of like re reading, reading n, you can read n over b by splitting the array into queues and you again have all of n, n over b. Yeah, so, well actually this n over b comes from someplace else, right? This required me to go down to, at the end, I, 
I went until I um, until I had n um, um, n parts of size one. Here I can stop when I have n over b parts of size b. And then once I have these, I can stop and I can I can sort each of these in a single pass. So I just I can stop a little bit earlier and then sort each chunk. I don't need to finish the recursion all the way at the bottom. And this is actually a useful thing. Anytime you implement any sort of thing with lots of recursion, when you get to about a constant size, you don't actually want to do the full recursion. You want to stop and do it brute force. This is with like a, a search tree, a kitty tree, or something like that. You want, really the same principle really helps a lot. Um, so I, I, can, I can get this n over. Okay, so now, um, and in fact, you can make this to a p parts of size m, um, and then you can make this. You know, an m. Okay. All right. So the only part that's left is how to get these um, these pivots. I need to get these m over b pivots. Okay. So this this turns out that you can't actually get m over b pivots in the linear amount of time in this much time, but you can get um, you can get square root of m over b pivots and asymptotically um, log of um, square root m over b of n over m is equal to big O of log So, so asymptotically, if I put a square root here, it's going to be this. Um, so you just need you just double the number of values. So you, now, now if you were to do this in practice, probably, and the way a lot of the really large sorians work is, you actually just pick these at random, uh, these pivots at random, like a quick sort. And this, this works pretty well. Um, you can actually get squared m over b pivots that evenly divide the data in, in, a, in, a, in a single pass. Um, so actually, I think I saw a paper recently that had hidden in it. You can actually get m over b, not squared m over b. But it's not hard to show squared m over b. But I, I don't have time to do that. So um, there's an extension of the linear time medium algorithm that maybe I'll do at this on Friday. Um, and, and you can run that essentially and do square root m over v of those in parallel to this um, OK, but this is basically how quick sort works. This is actually called the distribution sort. Um, and this, in practice, I believe, works a little bit faster than, than the merge sort. All right, so that's it for t for today. Hopefully, people have signed up for the the scribing and uh, videotaping. Did someone sign up for scribing for today's lecture? No. Uh, <laughs> I I thought I tested somebody had. I thought about doing it, but it looked like somebody had, so I signed up for another one. Okay. Well, you know, so yep. What can I do? Uh, you'll do it. Uh, okay, so there, there's LaTeX files and stuff on the website if you have questions. Uh, um, okay, great. So we'll talk about uh, B trees and some other related stuff on Friday. Um, okay, so I, I won't get to talk about, I wasn't going to, alternatively, I could talk about some graph algorithms in, in class on, on, on Friday. Would you would you would you rather I did that than than, than doing B trees? Or if you're in database, you might want to see B trees twice because you have to So okay, so let's do a vote. Who wants to see B trees? Who wants to see graph algorithms? <laughs> Some people raise their hand twice. Um, okay, well, I'll also favor also coming on Thursday so we can get both. Well, I, I, I have veto power over all this. So, so, so maybe on the following Wednesday, I'll do graph algorithms or I'll do kind of expansions to the